I would like to introduce Register of Copyrights and my boss, Register Shira Perlmutter. Shira, take it away. Thank you, David, and welcome everyone uh, to the Public Copyright Public Modernization Committee, to the members and also uh, members of the public who are joining us. Uh, and just as a reminder for those who may not have uh, joined before, uh, this committee was established by the Librarian of Congress uh, in order to allow us to hear from stakeholders about the work we're doing on copyright modernization and also to share our progress with you. Uh, and that progress has been substantial. Uh, so I'm very pleased to say that since we last met, uh, we passed two more of our quarterly software development milestones resulting in uh, work that you're going to see today and some major public releases. Uh, so I do wanna start with breaking news. Uh, after two years of development and extensive user experience testing, uh, the new copyright recordation application, the online recordation system uh, of the Enterprise Copyright System or ECS will be made available for use by the general public beginning on Monday. Uh, so you heard it here first, even before uh, the press release. And we gave this group a sneak preview of the recordation uh, application in our previous meeting. Uh, and you may remember uh, two of the major points about this. Uh, first, it's the first piece of our enterprise copyright system that's reached this important milestone. And it also replaces the oldest of our processes, which was a purely paper recordation system. So this is uh, overdue and we're very excited about it. Uh, second, on public records, uh, later this summer, our new public record system will achieve the same uh, accomplishment and we will be releasing it fully to the public, the system that's used by researchers and the public to uh, look up information about copyrights. Uh, and this will be the second major application release of the ECS. And finally, yesterday morning, uh, we released yet another set of 300 historical record books uh, on loc.gov, uh, which contain many thousands of additional registration records. So these are available, as you know, for your use on loc.gov, including the ability to download the scans themselves. So in a moment, you will be hearing a recap, uh, along with a demonstration of some of the work we've done in the six months since our last public meeting. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to hand the mic over to uh, our Chief Information Officer, uh, Judith Conklin, uh, for some additional remarks. So, Judith. Thank you, Shira. And good afternoon to everyone who joined us. As Shira said, I am the CIO at the Library of Congress. And I want to join Shira in welcoming you to the third official meeting of the Copyright Public Modernization Committee. And I'm very glad to see everyone here. Um, since this is the third <clears throat> public meeting of this committee, um, I wanted to state that we've already in the first two meetings extensively covered our tech, um, how our technology team um, is developing the enterprise copyright system and how we're partnering with the copyright office. And, if you missed the first two meetings, um, you can find the videos on our loc.gov website, as well as several ECS webinars um, on the Copyright Modernization website. But before um, we go on, I want to remind you about two points that we've discussed before. And I, I hit on the first one a little bit already, but this is a true partnership between the, the library, OCIO, and the Copyright Office. Um, we, and that's at every level. I want to assure you that Shira and I talk about ECS a lot, and we have a great partnership. And um, uh, the technology side, the, the team, the developers, the project manager, managers, there's several of them um, down to um, you know our infrastructure um, people they have um, a, a, they're working fantastically with the copyright team and the experts in copyright um, they do it every day 
And um, that's to ensure that we are delivering a platform that meets the needs of, of the copyright community. And we do that, um, the, the, the saying that Shira and I like to use, I actually stole it from Shira, that we can only be successful together. And Shira and I take that very um, seriously, that our teams need to work very closely together and they are working closely together. And the second thing is, and I really can't emphasize this enough, that our entire development process is built on feedback. We, re, we OCIO, um, the design team, uh, relies significantly on feedback from the copyright office staff, the experts, and real users like you. So we, we uh, want to know that everyone will be able to use what we're developing to accomplish their business needs. and. Um, uh, be able to use what, what we're developing. So, um, and that's every type of user, whether it's a high-end user, a power user, or the first time ever uh, person going into um, a copyright application. So that's why these public meetings are very important to us. Um, we've been making great progress, as Shira said, and we have a lot of good news to share. Um, and I'm looking forward to a lively discussion with you and um, the committee. And with that, David, I'll hand it back to you to get us started. Thank you, Judith. It's a really exciting time in the copyright office. Before I introduce our next speaker, who's going to be doing some software demonstrations, um, I'd like to provide a, a short background reminder primer to people who may be joining us for the first time that the Copyright Office uses the scaled agile methodology um, to, to, to manage our software. And this means that every quarter we have a big meeting of the whole group between OCIO and the Copyright Office with the, the, with the CIO is there, the Register of Copyrights is there and the staff of, who, who work on each of these projects. And we do a set of, of software demos. And most of what you're going to see today is cribbed from our most recent software demo. Um, we call this, it's in, in scaled agile terminology, it's, a, it's an inspect and adapt ceremony. So this is a, this is a little bit of a highlights of the inspect and adapt ceremony um, to, to members of the public. I also wanted to point out that the demos that you're going to see today are heavy on two of the ECS components that we have not looked at a lot previously. So we looked at the recordation system, we looked at the historical public records, we looked at the public record system, all of which are out in the public now. And Sarah is going to provide some demos of systems that are used by Copyright Office staff today, not just by members of the public. And then finally, for those of you who are waiting with, with bated breath for the, um, for, for the next big demo of the registration system, that's what we're shooting for, for our next public meeting that we'll do together, where we'll, we'll, we'll do this style of demonstration of the largest, you know, sort of the centerpiece of the enterprise copyright system. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Sarah Garski. Sarah is the Deputy Director of the Product Management Division of the United States Copyright Office and is the Product Manager for the Enterprise Copyright System, which is the, the star of our modernization work. Sarah, take it away. Thank you, David. Uh, and as always, I am delighted to be providing an update on ECS progress. It has been an eventful time for the ECS since I spoke to you last, uh, several months ago. We do continue to make great development strides uh, towards our vision of an intuitive and flexible enterprise system that incorporates registration, recordation, licensing, public record, and shared services capabilities to benefit the creative, creative community and the copyright staff. Uh, Shira already uh, uh, gave you sort of the highlights of what's happening in the next month, I won't tell you again. 
Uh, in our most recent quarterly development checkpoint, all of the ECS product teams demoed work in progress and refined their plans, uh, development plans for the upcoming quarter. And I'm gonna give you a few highlights. So the registration product team recently completed work on a range of internal and external features. On the staff side, development work supported correspondence and activity tracking features, as well as enhancements to the message center, notably enabling support for inline images as part of messages. Work on the applicant side included claims search, file upload, account management, and support for standard application payments. The registration product team also completed design work in support of the registration of a group of unpublished works, as well as on a born digital claims uh, refusal letter and process. And finally, the registration product team explored methods to manage and uh, create and manage the massive volume of supporting health content that will be needed for the system and completed the journey map of a claim. The registration product team is currently focused on capabilities for capturing claim submission and examination information, enabling registration certificate preview, and staff workflow capabilities. At the next meeting, as David noted, I will be excited to show you the work we have completed to date thus far on the registration product. As was previously noted, ensures breaking news. ECS Record Asian Release 1.8 is imminent and will mark the availability of Record Asian Section 205 submission capabilities to the general public. The product team recently has spent much of its time preparing for this release. The team has also worked on enhancing canned reporting capabilities, instructional and help text content enhancements, activity tracking features, and account management functions. In addition to supporting the imminent release, the team is getting to work on the next large set of features for examining Section 203 Notices of Termination. The Public Records System Release 5.0 will uh, is intended to include the ability to render reference copies of registration certificates processed through the ECHO system, as well as certificates of recordation. A future release is anticipated to include further enhancements to the detailed record view, including such things as hyperlinks to related registration and recordation records. Recent quantitative usability tests showed marked improvements in search relevancy and findability compared to baseline results from last year. The team has also worked on methods for improving user adoption to the new system versus the legacy public record catalog. And now I would like to demonstrate some software. And so I will share screen. And hopefully everyone can see. Looking great, Sarah. OK, good. All right. So what I'd like to show you first is the beginnings of a new product to support records and research certification services that are provided by the office. When completed, this ECS product that we call Service Request Processing will provide users uh, access to research services and requests for deposit copies. The public will be able to submit and pay for requests via this online portal. And copyright office staff will be able to estimate non-flat fees for research, as well as manage the internal assignment of requests and track progress. So we, uh, what, you see, what you see here is the beginnings of that uh, external portal. So uh, as a user, I am going to um, uh, request a copy estimate. You will see here that we have additional services uh, that we intend to make available. Uh, they are not yet ready yet, so we're just going to uh, do a copy estimate. So I'm going to select copy estimate, and I'm going to click next. OK, so then the next question that I get is, do I have a copyright number for the work I am requesting? The answer is yes, I do. So I click next, and I'm going to enter that number. And I see my 
my language has changed to something that is non-English. Okay, now we're good. All right, I'm going to enter this number. Seven three seven. No, that was right the first time. One seven three seven three nine six. Okay. Um, you will see here we have options or we have additional um, fields here uh, where in, envisioned is the in the future is the ability to pull um, the title and year of publication information based on the registration number. Again, that's that's uh, planned for uh, future work. So um, I am going to click add. And then you'll see here that I am um, requested or, or I'm being asked for the kind of service that I'm requesting. Um, in this case, I want an additional certificate and I would like for it to be certified. You see here, uh, if there is an additional registration number associated with this, I have the ability to enter that. I'm not going to do that at this point. I am just going to click next. And now I'm being asked what my relationship is to the request that I have made. I am the copyright owner. I am going to click next. And here I have the ability to um, uh, select regular processing or expedited. I'm going to select regular. And then I'm going to enter all of the various information that will help uh, the office process my request. And as you can see, I'm just entering dummy information because we are on a test, uh, we are in a test site. Sarah, we've had a couple of questions come up and I, um, if you don't mind if I, I weigh in. Sure. Um, one is, is, is there a reason that it says copyright number rather than copyright registration number? Uh, no, I don't believe that there is. And that is a piece of uh, feedback then that I can take back to the team. Um, and perhaps we add that. It seems like it would be a very easy thing to add. Yeah. And then a, a second question was whether it would be possible to to expand on your uh, about born digital works, um, and if um, from from one of our panelists, and if there are any uh, additional clarifications or or questions about that, um, I'd welcome the the panelists to, to unmute and ask as well. Sarah, in your comments um, and introducing the work that has been done, this is Jim Neal. Uh, yes. You mentioned you mentioned. Uh, uh, some work that was being done on born digital works. And I just, I wasn't, didn't mean to interrupt this presentation. I wanted you to comment further on that when you were done. Okay, sure. Happy to do that. Okay. Thank you, Jen. Uh, and sorry to put you on the spot. I, I could have could have saved that for the end. <laughs> that, that's okay. That is all right. Um, okay, so um, I have, that gave me an opportunity to enter all of my information. And I'm going to select review. And um, this, this, the fact that we're seeing the screen again may be a bug that we need to fix. Um, but again, I'm going to click next. And now I see that there is a request number that is associated with what I have just done. Uh, and you can also see that our uh, payment review component is not yet implemented. So this is this is where we are with this. Um, uh, but I can also tell you that the near planned development work uh, for this product includes enabling the payment capabilities that are needed via pay.gov, as well as uh, the ability to generate receipts um, and process um, uh, the ability for staff to look at uh, in process requests. Um, and for and actually that's for both staff and uh, external users. Okay, and now I'm going to Sarah. While you're jumping over to the the other, uh, yes the other system, I'm going to answer a couple of questions I got on on uh, a side chat. 
Um, one of which is a question that we also received via email before the meeting today, which is, will there be a separate deposit account for those who are using deposit accounts for different ECS applications, or will, will it be a single payment system that is used across all of ECS? Right, so uh, the intent, the eventual intent is a single deposit account across all work streams. Perfect, thank you. Um, and we have another question about the, the requests, which is who has access to these requests and how long will be, they be retained? I know that the question about retention is a, is a document, um, doc, there's a document retention policy for, for um, these requests already. Um, but can you start with who has access to the requests once they're, they are submitted? So if we're talking about the research requests so that there's a there's a limited group of people whose role in the office it is to process these requests. Um, there is um, a specific group of staff that do this. It's a very limited number, maybe 10, maybe give or take. Uh, and so that's the group of people who would have access to it. Great. Um, and uh, as far as the document retention, I, I believe that these fall under the standard 20 year document retention policy, but I will follow up with the members to find out what the document retention policy on research requests specifically, specifically is. Um, uh, I don't see any additional questions uh, coming through about this part of the demo. We don't do have another, um, we do have another a uh, question about another one of the, the areas, which I'll save for, for after this part of the um, demo. Okay, I can, I, you know, I can only like single thread things, David. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so now we're um, um, looking at um, uh, the licensing product. So uh, for those of you who may not have heard this spiel, spiel before, the purpose of the licensing product is to improve um, the efficiency by which the office ingests information from licensing remitters uh, and to improve specifically uh, uh, timeliness and accuracy of financial and statistical reporting produced by the office. Um, so I'm going to show you uh, like three features that have been worked on recently um, by the product team of, because I'm already logged in with a user that has this role, we're gonna look at um, uh, what is called the collections tab first. Uh, so <clears throat> this, this is the tab we're looking at here. You can see there's a lot of information. This is a pretty dense screen. Um, but this screen and this tab provides fiscal staff. So these are um, accountants in the licensing division who um, uh, need to look at the licensing payment information that we receive from pay.gov. Uh, anybody who's associated with the licensing product know, or the licensing process knows that as, that as of July 1st of this year, all licensing payments must be submitted via pay.gov. Um, again, I noted this is a very dense screen. There's a lots of lots of information uh, regarding the licensing statement of account that is important to this team. Uh, well, I, what I will say is that over here on the right, uh, if there, are, if I'm a member of that team, and I don't need to see all of these columns, I uh, we have enabled the ability to remove a number of these to make the screen a little more manageable. Um, now I'm going to, before we um, uh, go to another view uh, as a different user, I'm gonna go back to my um, statement of accounts view and I'm going to drill into one in particular. Oh, this is not a good one. This one has an underpayment detected. Let's scroll back, see if we can actually get a payment. Again, this is all dummy data. So 
Um, okay. Well, we may not have any um, may not have any ability to look at actual numbers here, but you will see you can see uh, that um, uh, there there actually should be okay uh, that. It looks like we're looking for a payment to have been uh, received by the office associated with this SOA, with the statement of account, excuse me. Okay, so now I am going to... I'm going to log out. I'm going to stop sharing briefly so that no one sees what my password is. Sarah, I told several of our, our panelists and co-hosts that I'd prepared a little dance number for when we went off of screen sharing. And uh, Great. But I, I have to admit now in front of everybody in the audience that I that I was bluffing. I didn't really prepare a dance number, but um, I did I did want to say there were a, um, a couple of questions that came to me on a side chat about the licensing um, licensing specifically. And one of those questions was uh, about the amount of licensing revenue that the copyright office manages. Um, and I, I, did, I did want to share that um, there's recent breaking news that the copyright office had um, a, a clean audit of our, of our um, and we now have a, a, a many years running of a clean external audit of the licensing um, management of the, the licensing dollars. And I, um, I know that this will, will be in the recording later and I'll be able to verify um, what uh, the, the number is, but the number, the amount of dollars managed by the copyright office in the, in the licensing system, system is over a billion dollars. Um, so it's a, it's a sizable, um, a sizable chunk of, um, chunk of change. Um, and then we got one other um, question about uh, how how the licensing statement of account statements of account come to the copyright office, which I th um, may be a thing. If um, if we're not ready to um, show that today, maybe we could just talk through it a little bit. How they come to the copyright office, right? Uh, meaning in electronic or paper form. Exactly. Yeah, both ways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks for vamping for me, David. Uh, it's it, my pleasure. Uh, yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. It's not as good as a dance number if I had really prepared one, but um, okay. here we are. Back to your back to your regularly scheduled programming. Yeah. Um, uh, Yeah, keep vamping for a moment if you don't mind. So one of the things that you'll note as Sarah has gone through the demos and we actually trimmed down the number of roles that you're seeing demonstrated from our original uh, attempted demo. But one of the things that you're seeing is that there are actually a number of different things that people would see in the enter enterprise copyright system based upon their role in the system. So even inside the copyright office, it's not a one size fits all. The people who are reviewing statements of account versus the people who are doing sort of a bulk review versus the people who would be doing the research and record certification reviews are, are different sets of people. So one of the things that Sarah is juggling quite admirably today is keeping track of multiple credentials so that she can show you what the system looks like from a vast array of different entry points and levels of um, levels of availability, sort of role user roles that people have. 
Right. And it refuses to uh, log me out as myself and give me the ability to log in as somebody else, which is part of the problem I'm having right now. All right. Well, we may have it. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I can just talk about the third feature that I was going to show, which was the ability to ingest a statement of account where I would have uh, noted the fact that um, uh, most of the statements of account that we would be ingesting via that particular process are received in electronic form. So that feature uh, shows, you know, basically shows you the screen that an examiner, separate from the fiscal staff view that I was just showing, the examiner view uh, has the ability to actually perform the ingestion to select uh, a statement of account file, and those are Excel files. And then there's an ingestion process, um, which notably is not actually attaching the file to, um, to the module, but is rather pulling the data out of the file so that we can see it in a different format. Uh, and then also worthy of noting is that as an examiner, once I have successfully ingested the statement account, I have the uh, temporary option to remove that file um, if I've made an error. Um, but once I navigate away from that screen as an examiner, that option is no longer available to me. Um, so my apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, Nothing like a live demo. Um, so uh, on on the in uh, in the near future front uh, for the licensing product, um, work includes the ability to uh, for fiscal staff to process refunds uh, as well as additional support for fiscal reconciliations. And with that, uh, I uh, thank you all for joining and I thank you for your indulgence of um, nothing like a live demo. And as David said, juggling multiple credentials uh, in order to show you this. Uh, and with that, back to you, David. Thank you, Sarah, much appreciated. Um, and you can, uh, Feel free to stop your screen share now. Um, and I've I've got a couple additional questions from panelists, which um, a couple of which I may field directly, and a couple of which I may hand over to um, other panelists from the the copyright office and or uh, our, our colleagues in OCIO. So the uh, a question about the just completed licensing demo was whether the infrastructure or functionality on the licensing side is built to anticipate licensing of other kinds of works. Um, the example given is literary works. And um, uh, they, the answer to that is, uh, um, is probably a resounding yes and no. Um, I think the, the platform is certainly extensible and the platform is owned by the Copyright Office. So it's not something that we can't extend. Um, but I wonder if uh, I might hand it to hand the the microphone to Jim Karamanis for a minute, or one of the our other colleagues in OCIO Design and Development to talk about what the process would be for extending something like the licensing system to a different uh, category of works, or or possibly Natalie Buddha Smith if uh, Jim is not on. Uh, David, let's actually pass that on to Mike Nyback. I think he's the best person to answer that, and he's perfect. on the call. Oh, perfect. Mike, I didn't even see you on the call. I, I appreciate it very much. Um, uh, so again, the question is, could you talk a little bit about the process for extending the functionality that has been built specifically for, um, you know, in the in this example, if it were built specifically for for satellite royalties, or if it were built specifically for another kind of royalties, what what the process would look like for extending it to um, something like um, uh, licensing of literary works? Uh, sure, David. Thank you. I'd be glad to speak to that briefly. Um, I don't want to go into a whole lot of technical detail about how we build these tools, except to state that. 
whenever we analyze a business problem that comes across, we think of it not in terms of just that very specific need, but we do contemplate larger similar needs to that. And when we build the actual components to do that, we build it in a way that is meant to be extendable and dynamic and be able to change over time. So it does depend on the, depend on the complexity of the change, but our entire process, our software engineering process, our program management process is built around that concept of change. So we're constantly reaching out to customers about changes. We're looking at bugs or enhancements. And all of our cycle about analyzing those requirements just feed back into the, the, the processes in the system that built the component in the first place. So we're, our, our, our goal here is to be in kind of a continuous delivery mode and for the system to grow dynamically as the needs of the United States Copyright Office changes. We don't consider this a, a done and walk away. Um, we're gonna be here working on this system uh, as long as it's needed. Thanks, Mike. And that, that gives me an opportunity actually to, to give a, a brief advertisement for the Copyright Office's strategic plan, which if you haven't seen is, is, is quite a short document and it's very readable and it's meant to be very actionable. But one, one of the things that we've gotten the most um, positive and, and consistent feedback on is the, the, the work of continuous development which is one of the high four high level strategic goals of the Copyright Office. And the continuous development is the recognition that in the past we have had, we have made the mistake of doing a flurry of activity to build the system and that the system stagnates and that the goal of the current work is not so much to build a single system, but to put ourselves on a footing that allows us to continue the development of those systems over time. Um, we had one more question come in from a panelist now that the, the demo is over. Um, and the question was specifically about um, registration deposit material and um, who would be able to access deposit material under which circumstances and are those deposit materials limited to lit litigation context. So the, um, with my apologies, our director of registration and our product med manager for the, the registration ECS development are both on vacation today. So we're a little bit shorthanded in this specific way. Um, but this is a question that I can answer at least in the, in, in the broadest sense. So there is a statutory right to ins for, for inspection of deposits, which doesn't mean that we necessarily hand it over to someone. But for instance, if you make a physical deposit of an item with the Copyright Office now, it's possible for somebody to make a request to inspect that, that deposit. And that would not be limited to the context of, of, of legal action. Um, but the functionality that we looked at actually was for the request of um, uh, requests that come in to, for litigation support, essentially. Um, and with that, I would like to invite our members of the Copyright uh, Public Modernization Office to turn on their cameras and get their finger on the mute button um, and we may want to use that or get their finger on the un, unmute button. Um, and we may be able to use that as a, a jumping off point for, for conversation by the group. Um, and, uh, I will, I will, um, offer again that it is our intent in the next public meeting to have our um, our director of registration, our product manager for the registration product here in live, live and in the flesh to, to provide the demos so that may be that we can go into a deeper answer of specific um, sort of feature and functionality questions there. Um, I, I would also note that there um, is at least one case now with electronic copies that are deposited with the Copyright Office where they are selected into Library of Congress collections and presented to patrons of the library in a rights restricted context. Um, and that that would be another, an, another specific case where it's not um, done in a, in a specific litigation context. So I'd like to um, next recognize Jeff Sedlick, who is a CPMC member and Jeff, feel free to unmute yourself and jump right in. Thank you. So, um... 
very interested in learning about what the plans are for the API that will allow uh, third parties to develop systems to enable uh, creators and other copyright holders to submit registrations through um, uh, through the software that they work in in their normal workflow. And I'd, I'd, I'd really like to hear more about the timeline for when that might be available and what kind of progress has been made to date. Great. Um, so I, I think again we don't have the the registration product owners on the on the call today, but I think we can flag that for a for a, um, a a top topic. I will say that in general our approach has been to build the human interfaces prior to the the, the API interfaces, um, and that we are not we 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 have not completed the work of the human interfaces for the the copyright registration system. So the human interfaces, when I talk about that, part of that is um, uh, the in context help, which has been a big part of what our user testing has identified. Um, how do people know if something is published or unpublished is a is a great big question that nobody really knows the answer to Well, somebody knows the answer to but but it's a harder question to answer than it seems like it should be. Um, but I also um, did want to offer that I, I think that that there has been that this is a, a broad area of um, that this is a broad area of um, investigation by the whole agency, sort of how um, system to system access will um, be enabled by various systems. And that there has been some work that has gone into, um, if you've seen uh, in, the, in the broader agency, there's a, there's a page on lsc.gov called LC for Robots which sort of talks about how some of that, that kind of work has been done. And, and I know that LC Labs has also begun some investigatory um, uh, avenues about how to use Library of Congress collections in, um, in, a, in a programmatic way. Um, I will say that the, the work on something as far along as what, what you described, like the, the ability for someone to programmatically submit a registration claim is is essentially not begun that's that's far on the horizon with that said i think there are some um shorter you know some possible half steps that are that are before um even if the registration claim couldn't be done entirely by api one of the things that we're looking at is whether it's possible for you know to have uploads happen via um uh, via an API, even if the registration claim itself had to be made, or if they're good. But again, this is really exploratory at this point, and we're really focused on primarily the the human interface as aspects. Um, so just as a brief follow up then, so as a development philosophy, there are any number of ways to go, as we all know. One way is to build a system kind of API first, and then, and I don't know what the technical term for that is, but then you build the copyright office UI and UX to attach to that API as one example of a system that can attach to that API. Because if you first build a system without considering everything that has to go on with the API, then circling back on it uh, becomes uh, a labor of love, shall we say, yeah, of, yes. of, many, of many decades. And so I think it would be, because this is top of mind for, especially in the photography space, the visual artist space, um, I think it would be great for the office or the library to have some messaging on what the plan is for that, for that, and to, uh, because uh, visual artists especially are very focused and excited about the prospect of being able to submit registrations from within their workflow. And if that's just not going to happen, um, then they should just be told that so they can be excited about being able to submit uploads, possibly via an a through an API. Right. Jeff, thank you, and I have flagged that in in, in my notes for additional follow up, and I appreciate the 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 input. Um, and certainly, this is um, you know not the only time the the office has has sort of heard this about photography in in particular. So it's it's good to have it, it reconfirmed here in in this context. Thank you. Um, I'd like to throw it open to the. I have um, I have prepared some. Uh, um, uh, additional thought, thought questions for um, for um, the um, group, but it looks like Susan Cherkoff has, uh, um, has her hand raised. So Susan, go ahead. 
Uh, so this is sort of a follow up to what Jeff was asking about, but um, not directly, I guess. Um, but it's the same question I ask um, each time, which is about um, bulk processing. So for large um, uh, copyright owners, um, I, I, I work for the Recording Industry Association of America. My members are large record companies. They have new, you know, numerous new releases each week. They would like to be able to sit down once a week and you know um, register 40 works at once and be able to do it in some um, efficient way um, in, and not have to refill all the basic information that goes in every application, um, not have to upload what, whatever um, digital deposits they might be submitting one by one, not have to pay one by one. And, and most importantly, not have the system freeze, you know, when, when they're doing this is, which is what they tell me happens all the time. And so is, is, is that in the, in the pipeline yet for um, uh, kind of the, the, the first rendition of the new system? That's a, that's a great question. So one, one of the things that we were hoping to do a little bit with both the release of the recordation system, which is coming out this next week, as well as with the, the demo of the licensing system is to show a little bit of how the office has been working on bulk processes. Um, most of what, what you would have seen in the, the, the recordation demo that we did before really is um, almost all bulk processes that are that are um, come out of a, a data file rather than just one by one entry of fields. And same goes for the, the statement of accounts review that we were looking at. So certainly this is this topic is is near and dear to our hearts. Um, I, I wonder if um, um, in the on the topic of of bulk um, bulk operations, if um, Natalie Buddha Smith from from OCIO, who is our um, who is our um, our head of user experience design, might want to talk about that a little bit and about what we've heard in some of the um, user feedback that we've already gotten. I know this has been a, a, a topic that has been. Um, Natalie, are you are you with us? Is that? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Um, yeah, I can just briefly, uh, we, we do know it is uh, something that is um, uh, highly valuable to our end users. It comes up often in our user research and it is something that is in discovery um, in order to, to understand, you know, all the implications of what's needed. Um, so it, it is currently um, something that we're pursuing from a um, design perspective and understanding through um, user research and user feedback that Judith re referenced earlier in our call. Uh, I don't have any more specifics to give you, but we do know, uh, and the, the product scrum team does know that this is of high value to our users. Um, that, that, that's great. And um, if I could help connect you with people at um, my member companies who could um, walk you through what their specific needs are, um, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. The thing we would love to have any, any sort of contact for people to use in our user research. We adore that. Please send it our way. Thank you. I'm, I'm smiling because this is something that Natalie is often asking the copyright office for. So this is a good connection to be made. And thank you, Susan, for that. Um, yeah, so should, should I just correspond with you, David? To, um, that's, yeah, with, with Alice and I both. Um, okay. And, and, and uh, um, that's extremely helpful. I will, um, I, I will confess now that um, when we have reached out to people who have um, volunteered to do user testing or um, user research with us. The uptake has not always been as high at the point of actually getting to doing the work as we as we hoped it would be. And it, it is, in fact, it's kind of an onerous process. So sometimes the, the time delay between getting uh, you providing your feedback and then sort of seeing how the feedback has been incorporated is quite long for people who, you know, people are expecting to see it, you know, in the same phone call or, or, or the next day. And it, and it, it, it really, what happens is it gets fed into the, the agile software development process and, and goes, you know, it, it sort of takes time to percolate back through, through subsequent releases. So it's good to have, um, the more we can have, um, the assistance of people like yourself to sort of get people excited about helping us with the testing process, 
to give you all a sense of um, the, the, the pilot program for the um, recordation system that's going, going live um, has, has, I think, gone through something like eight, eight, over 8,000 recorded documents have been sort of taken through the pilot system during the feedback process and, and iteratively improved. And as you, as you may have noted, the release 1.8 that's going out, which is the, the release that's going out to the public, that means that we've had eight major releases that have gone out while we've been incorporating the feedback from, from real users of the system who are using the system to, to, to record documents. Um, so I know, I know we've had a little bit of chat specifically about um, a question that we had um, expounding on born digital work. And I wanted to just give Sarah Garski a chance to um, put, um, turn on your camera again and talk to us a little bit about the, the, what the born digital um, work there was referencing. Right. So um, the uh, Jim asked the question um, about born digital works. And um, so my apologies if I was not super, super clear um, that the design work that has been done is on a born digital refusal letter, claim refusal letter. So it has nothing to do uh, nothing inherently to do with a, a specific kind of work, whether it's born digital or not born digital. Um, so again, the uh, the intent is um, that this is a sort of an artifact associated with a claim that could follow the registration through the system uh, throughout its entire life cycle. And uh, it would be primarily digital, but um, could be printed and, you know, sent via US postal mail if needed. Hope that helps. Thank you, that, that's very helpful. Okay. Um, it, is, it is interesting even during, so I'm, um, I'm coming up on my, um, my, my 15th year of federal service. And for those of you who are also in federal service, you know that 15 years is a, is a, is a big time when the, the, the vacation time goes up uh, at the end of um, 15 years in the, in a federal agency, but I, in my 15 years in the agency, one of the, the switches that has happened is we tend to think of the physical thing as a printout of the original now, rather than thinking of the digital thing as a scan of the printed one. It, it, it does, it has just sort of, ex, it has flipped over um, entirely. So we had a, another question on the side from, from one of our members that was talking about what kinds of users we would be interested in, in doing user testing with. And the specific question was, um, would there be interest in users who are trying to ascertain right status for something like an exhibition or education or research or scholarship needs? Um, so I wanted, I wanted to offer that the, there's a, um, there's a, uh, uh, well, I guess a captive audience here. We have a little bit of a captive audience at the Library of Congress of this sort of user group who have been extremely gracious with their time in looking at the way that these systems work. And those are the, the sort of librarians and the, the staff of the Library of Congress specifically. However, this is, um, th there is a, a, a broad need for this, you know, for particularly the systems that are used for research by members of the public to ascertain rights. There's a broad need for those to be useful to the widest array of purpose, you know, for the widest array of purposes, not just for um, the, the users who are actually inputting the, the data into the system in the first place. I would also note that um, as we have begun to publish the historic record, the historical records um, online, which previously the, the primary ways, there were two primary ways for people to get access to the Copyright Office's historical records. The first and um, most common way was to either live in or fly to Washington DC and come to a reading room at the li Library of Congress and look at books. 
um, the, the copy of these, the, the, the primary copy of these was just sitting in a reading room at the library. And there's all sorts of reasons that that specific process was not ideal for the researchers and was not ideal for the copyright office, but there are, um, there are extremely many new reasons from a global pandemic that have taught us that when we close down the reading rooms and that when people are, are unable to travel and that when the economy is largely shut down, that the inability to do that kind of research is a real impediment. And then the second way is actually, we, we talked a little bit about in the earlier demo, the research and record certification, um, the process of going through and getting some a, a researcher at the library to do the, the kind of, um, the kind of research. So going looping back one more one more time to the um, to the previous question about what kinds of, of users we'd like to have using the system, we absolutely have room now for um, users who are and and Natalie has has reconfirmed this repeatedly with us for users who are um, of of the novice sort. And I would also add that there is that the copyright public record system, which is the primary system that would be used for this sort of purpose right now, is in a live pilot and is starting to come out of pilot. But there's actually a feedback mechanism on publicrecords.copyright.gov for that, for that kind of feedback to be provided directly. And I can tell you that we, again, we, we don't get as much feedback as we hope we will, and we don't get as much uptake on the user testing as we hope we will. And it means that the more we get in by this kind of mechanism, the better. I've just gotten a note from our director of copyright records saying, the more feedback, the better with two exclamation points. Um, and that is, that, is really, um, that is really an open invitation to everyone who's listening from members of the public, as well as um, members of this committee to send out to, to your, your stakeholders. Um, so I'd like to recognize Keith Kuferschmidt next. Um, Keith, take it away. Thank you. So a lot of the things you just said, everyone else on the panel may be completely understand. I did not, so excuse my ignorance here and maybe the stupidity of my questions that will come up next. So my, okay, so first, I guess several, several different questions. I'll start with the first one, which is when you talk about records, what is encompassed in a record? Is it just copyright data? Is the, the actual copyright application? A registration certificate is it all of that plus the copy of the work? Like, what what do you mean by records? That's a great question. So when we talk about records, we we internally that's shorthand for essentially in in the olden days you could think of that as the form that was filled out, not the deposit copy. So typically when we talk about the actual deposit copies, we say deposit copies. And when we talk about records, we're talking about something that has a record retention policy with NARA, which means that we have a, it has a, here's the number of years that you keep it and here's who's allowed to see it. And here's what happens with it when it's, here's the disposition of it when it goes out of the, the copyright office. And thanks for that. And I don't think that was a, um, I don't. I don't think that was a stupid question at all. I just. I just admitted to 15 years of federal service, but I would say 12 years into federal service, I would not have known the answer to the question. Between, and so I apologize for using that shorthand. So thank no, you for clarifying that for everybody on the call. Okay. So then, a f sort of follow up question to that, which is, if there is the record information, just the data that's on the form or the form itself. And the reason I ask is, and this came up uh, on a on a separate Zoom or whatever let's say somebody in their application accidentally puts their social security number on there or something else that might be PII or something like that. Um, so is it just the data that is uh, made made available or uh, is it the actual form and then maybe some of that form is redacted or something like that? So it is public records includes the index information from the registration, which is like the, the data, what you would think of as the data, but also includes um, the, the application. Um, and I, I would point out too that 
even though the shorthand when I talk about about records, the deposit copies are, you know, they are subject to a record retention policy as well. We do those those are are technically records. Though when I was talking about records, so the copyright public record system doesn't currently have deposit um, de deposit copies in it. Okay, and then the last of my questions, and I see other people are lining up, so I'll stop. But you mentioned uh, the it used to be that I think that you could only get these records by going to the reading room and accessing these records. And it sounds like either before or during the pandemic, I'd love to say after, but unfortunately we're still dealing with that, but uh, that, that now you've kind of loosened that up and there's other ways. Can you talk a little bit about how, uh, without going to a reading room, obviously, if the copyright office people could access that, uh, those records and I'll stop there. Yeah, that's a great question. I feel like that was almost a, I mean, I, I, I just swear Keith is not a ringer in this context. He didn't, this is not, a, he, uh, so this is a great, um, this gives me a chance to sort of um, give a, um, uh, an advertisement for some of the, the, the work we've done to sort of open this up. Um, in, in some ways, it was a little bit coincidental that it happened during the pandemic because it was work that had been begun before the pandemic. So the first thing, is that the historical public records, and in this context, records means the 26,000 bound volumes of registration applications. They're, they're, these are um, the actual like physical registration copy that was sent to the Copyright Office um, beginning all the way back in, in the 1800s. Those volumes we have begun to digitize and post online at loc.gov. And we began with the most recent ones that were that were that were done in the in the in the paper process that we don't have electronic um, claims for, which are in, in the late 70s and have been moving backward in time. So that's the first thing is that for the first time, someone who used to have to come to the copyright office and request a book and then wait for the book can just go on now and browse the book on, on loc.gov, which is, which is a big, you know, it's a, a big improvement. And then the second thing is that publicrecords.copyright.gov, which is the, it's the copyright public record system, has been having increasing data available in it and increasing um, um, information available to it, which is sort of the second category that you pointed out. It's, it's the data on the forms primarily in this case. And in this case, um, if you know, if you go to um, publicrecords.copyright.gov and you search for David Brunton, you'll see that somebody named David Brunton registered a poem on, in the with the United States Copyright Office, coincidentally on what happened to me my first day of work here. Um, and but you will not see the poem itself. It's just a record about the registration of the poem and. The publishing of that information is, um, is, is, it's a statutory requirement that that be made available to the public. And we are starting now to make the 1870 to 1977 information available in a way that's more like the post-1977 information available. Um, so that's a, that's a slow process that starts with scanning old books. Um, I'm right. much appreciated, Keith. Okay. And Thanks. I think the next person with the hand up was Jeff Sedlick again. So Jeff, could you uh, unmute yourself and jump in? Sure. So, um, you know, we we're talking about born digital and paper and which, which comes first these days. And I think you're right. Um, and that brings to mind, and I know the registration people are not on this call, but this is being recorded and they can watch it and hopefully address it in a later meeting because there's these gaps between the meetings. So. Uh, the regulations, in, 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 in good measure, were written, uh, at, at, as to the registration process, were written to support paper registrations. And, and the office has done a good job of updating them to uh, be more in line with online registration. But that process has been limited by the inefficiencies of the current system, which is not a good system. No. Good people, bad system, right? So, so um, a big deal for the, those those users of the system, especially in the visual arts world where I come from, 
is knowing whether it's the office's intent to go through and update the regulations once there's a more efficient system in place to kind of move out and set aside the limitations that were placed on registrations at a time when um, you had to fill out a piece of paper and somebody was de designing a form in the late 70s or 80s and now we're suffering with those those regulations that require things like separating uh, group registrations by the year of of first publication which there's no statutory justification for that there is statutory justification for indicating the date the, the you know the month and year of first publication but it's a huge expense and a huge burden for visual artists at least and i think for all creators to have to separate their registrations by the year of first publication and for some they just give up when faced with trying to organize their registrations and incur that separate expense for each and every year in which something was first published the second example would be in 2018 the office put a limitation of 750 works on group registrations of, of photographs both unpublished and published previous to that there was no limitation provided that you didn't use the continuation form you could submit 100,000 works and some photographers did on individual registrations and what that did was put a tremendous burden on the examiners who are using this very inefficient, difficult to use system. They couldn't review images all on the same screen. It was a hot mess. So there was a justification for placing that limit temporarily, um, but I would very much like to know um, if the office would intend to relax that because taking photographers, for example, a photographer might create 2,000 to 4,000 works, distinct copyrighted works in a single day. It's very much unlike registering a book or any other type of work, even an illustration. Um, and so 2,000 to 4,000 works, they're, being, they, they, they're faced with this Hobson's choice now of which works can they register, which works are most likely to be infringed. They can't afford to break that apart and spend hundreds of dollars to register just one day's work, let alone one week's work. And so um, it would be great to see, to know if the office would be considering relaxing that um, number, that limitation that was placed in 2018 to allow us to register more works on a single group registration and also to allow us to register works that were first published in different calendar years on the same group registration. That's thank thank you for that. And those are those are great questions. And that's exactly the way that the, the office is thinking through many of these. Um, I, I, I think specifically for the the question of the registration policy aspects of it, there are some parts of that that are going to be subject to the, the public comment process and the rulemaking process. Um, but I can tell you that from a technical perspective specifically, that there are two areas where we have limitations on our side that have been sort of frustrating to the copyright office and frustrating to people who are who are users of the copyright office, people who interact with the copyright office. One is limitations on the size of an upload. And that mean, I mean, literally just like the, the, the file size. And two is the limitation on the number of file members, the, of, of, of file names. And that from a technical perspective, those are very much areas where we're looking at how we can um, overcome the limitations of the existing legacy system. Now, as far as would the office revisit, revisit the, the, the rulemaking process and, and sort of how that, how that process would conduct, I can't comment on that, but, but I, can, I can tell you that from a technical perspective, we're actively pursuing ways to overcome the technical limitations that were put in place. And, and those aren't the only cases where the legacy system, which none of us on this call are huge fans of, have, have, have sort of provided limitations to what we can do. Um, does, that, does that answer your question, Jeff? And also I bookmarked this for, I've got my, my clipboard where I'm, I'm making my notes. I bookmarked this for, for a specific question for us to dive into in the, in the registration deep dive as well. It, it does. Uh, just a brief clarification request. So um, there, in an earlier presentation, it was mentioned that there was progress on the group registration for published works. That's different than the group registration for public photographs. And so I just want to find out if those are proceeding together or if the, the group registration of published works is going to get done first, and then they're going to begin the, the, pho the photography one. So I I think I, I don't I don't really answer that off the top of my head, but I um, I do know that the single the standard application and and one group registration have have gone through first 
and that that's that the intent is for the for other groups to follow close on the heels. But I also know that as the work has gone forward on that, that the user experience has actually combined more of what used to be completely separate things into single into single workflows as well. Um, I want to pause here for just a moment and invite members of the public that we are um, we're about 15 minutes from the end of our time and that if you want to submit questions in the Q&A, we can continue to do that. And I'm gonna to continue to call on members of the committee um, while we're doing that. And if you have questions for members of the committee, you're also welcome to, to, to have those. So um, Pamela Malpas, can I uh, call on you next? Go ahead and unmute yourself. Sure, uh, so Mike, I have two questions. One of them is on um, recordation and uh, is related and somewhat uh, to what Jeff was talking about in the way that um, the new system does or does not reflect um, the regulations and vice versa. Um, so in recordation in particular, the, the, the um, section 205 says that the, um, the recordation is considered constructive notice only if the, the work on which this recordation is being filed um, has been registered. Now in a paper processing, somebody could have submitted this recordation, um, paperwork request documentation um, without having that registration because they wouldn't necessarily know or, or they just didn't, the sequencing was not, you didn't have to do, you weren't making, paper is paper and submit one form first and the second one later, whatever. Uh, but in this digital environment, I'm wondering, is that built into the system that when you go to, to for the recordation, does it stop you and say, wait, is this registered? If it's not registered, don't go further. I'm just curious about that as a- uh, That's a great question. And I think um, I could invite um, Ken, can you, who is our product manager for the recordation application to, briefly unmute and address, is there, can, can, is there um, validation of previous registration built into the system at all? Yeah, I'm I'd be happy to take that question. So there's actually a couple of scenarios that when we spoke with our users during usability testing that they presented to us. So one is that we have a data validation that's there so that you must provide at least a title or a registration number. So if you do not have a registration number, you can still proceed with recording the document. Um, a lot of times we hear uh, folks tell us that, you know, they're recording a document and their registrations are still in progress. So we also have functionality where you can go in and correct your application. So once you get the registration numbers, for that work, you can go ahead and go back to your service request and make the modifications or amplify that work information with the correct registration number. And one last piece is that if you go into the system and you do not have a registration number, we do give our users a nice little nudge that says, hey, we recognize that you, know, you didn't register your work. Is this something that you would like to do? So we give them a notification just after the fact, just to remind themselves that, you know, you might want to register these works. David, back to you. Thank you, Ken. Ken and Pamela, you said you had two questions. What, was that was that two combined, or was there one more question? No, that was that that was one of two, and I'm going to sneak in a cheeky third question since Ken Ken mentioned it, um, which was a reference to the um, service request number, which I also saw in one of the earlier demos. Um, on the screen just appeared as SR number. And I think like having copyright registration number rather than copyright number, that, that maybe is not intuitive to people who are outside the development process that SR yes. number, you can sort of figure it out, but it'd be helpful for it to say service request number, also known as SR. That's helpful. Just, and I've just, just gotten a note from, I've just gotten a note from our product manager that she has taken that down as a feature request. Okay. All right, uh, but my more meaningful question, perhaps not relevant for this um, and shut me down if it is, uh, because I know we're here to talk about IT, but I know part of the modernization is um, involves some of the support systems and that there is a new sort of physical warehouse for materials. And as long as we're talking about security and, and so on of deposit materials, I'm just sort of curious to what extent um, the, the, those new physical facilities reflect uh, new physical considerations of floods and fires and the stuff we're all dealing with now. So, so um, 
that's a great I'm I'm just trying to think about who I would who I would um um can can is that another question so I'm I'm not sure uh, can you uh can you possibly rephrase the question a little bit yeah, as I say, it, it may not be relevant to this discussion since we're talking about IT and I'm just talking about the physical structure that if there is a new physical facility for storage and it's a warehouse and it's new, it's state of the art, it's climate controlled, it's X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, I think we've all found that wherever that location may be, we're facing new kinds of threats. And if this great new facility that now contains all of these extremely precious materials is, you know, subject to unanticipated flooding i'm just that's it's, it's probably funny. not relevant for here but yeah, david, well, no. <laughs> david i think um that's a little bit different than the recordation yeah. question yeah. i was going to see if anyone else on the panelist might be able to take that so i think we actually just um i i think that uh denise wolford who would have been the person to take that question might have just jumped off of the the panel for another meeting but i do i do want to say that um now that I've been at the agency for 15 years and I have, I have um, when the copyright cards were digitized, the primary driver behind the digitization of the copyright cards at that time was not access. It was, it was preservation. It was the digitization of, because there was only one copy of those copyright cards anywhere anywhere in the world. And I think it's a great question for us to think about and to bear in mind that there are, you know, that this is like a, a, a real issue. I would also say that, um, you know, I, we don't have our, the Library of Congress's Director for Preservation on, on the call today, but this is an area where the entire agency has is is extremely, because we have in fact just moved into a new warehouse space and we are, we are, and I can tell you that there were experiences of, you know, items that were damaged from the from the previous. And so I think this is a great thing for us to think about. I'd like to bookmark it since we don't have, um, uh, since we don't have uh, the the folks on the call who would like address this Thanks. directly. Yeah, I don't know. We can take it. Much appreciated, yeah. um, Kathleen. Um, if you would un unmute yourself yes. and and jump in now, and then we have another question for. Um, we have another question from the from the public. Okay, I just wanted to be clear on the records in the public record system. So the newer records, it's data only. It's not copies of any applications or certificates or anything. Well, in no plan in, for that, or is in, that coming? Or? I mean, in the case of the newest records, many times there have not actually been a, a, an application. Um, right, They're, those were submitted via a system where somebody just fills out a form and submits the. Some, some or fills out a an electronic online, okay yeah, electronic I see what and, you're saying. and submits a so um so there there would not be in that case uh a, a sort of like print facsimile there there one has never existed okay so there's yeah. no plan to put a copy of the final registration certificate there or anything like that right now so registration certificates um that would be a question for our product manager for the copyright public record system who also okay. is <laughs> no no who's here oh. <laughs> and and who also is the the person who the question from the member of the public um came in for which was a question about linkages plan between metadata in the copyright public record system and, and elsewhere. Um, so not not directly related to your question, but um, Sean Sean Gallagher, would you be able to unmute yourself briefly and, and address these two topics? So registration certificates in the copyright public record system and um, data linkages between the copyright public record system and um, and other systems. Sure, David, thanks. Um, both of those things are on our roadmap. Um, I know that in our in our requirements, there's been lots of reports and analysis about uh, accessibility of copyright information, and there have been requests to make the uh, certificates of registration and certificates of recordation uh, available in our public catalog. Um, those are available right now at the office through the copyright imaging system, but you do have to come on site for that 
um, with the pandemic, it, it made us realize that that was, you know, more important than uh, perhaps it used to be at one point. So that is definitely on our roadmap. Uh, and as far as interoperability with other systems, that is also um, on our roadmap as well. We know that there are a lot of industry standards that people reference uh, when they do provide information about their works to the Copyright Office. And so that is a, that's a linkage that we're looking to make uh, at some point when we when we move the system forward. Thank you, thank you, Sean, and um, I'm much appreciated. Um, so we had a, um, a sort of a complicated multi-part question from from several panelists, but I'd like to actually start by um, just reading a reading a version of the question. Um, and then echoing its importance. I think um, as soon as it as it comes out, it will be recognized as as important by everyone. And maybe we can kind of have this as our our sort of final topic of conversation, which is that as the new systems go live, and as the number of records grows, do we anticipate re requests to access and carry out big data research projects? Um, and then we had a second of the question, and then a, a follow-on question to that, which is, if the answer is yes, will there be a charge for the bulk access necessary to do the research? And if so, who would receive the money for that charge? And I think this is a question that goes straight to the heart of a, something that every organization is thinking about right now. Um, and Jim Neal, I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit, I know you have some experience in this area, sort of thinking about this more broadly. Is there any more um, comment that you'd want to provide on that? I can say that we don't have um, a policy framework in place for this right, right now, but I, I'd be interested to sort of hear any additional input from you or any of the other members on that if, you're, if, if there's interest. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief, David. I've sat uh, with a number of organizations over the years that have actually accumulated lots of data uh, of various types. And inevitably what comes be from behind that uh, is quick quickly is request to be able to mine that data uh, for big data research projects. And it was very important to have in place a policy framework, but also a review and approval process uh, for dealing with those requests. And I think by raising my question, I was only encouraging us um, and you uh, to anticipate that and to begin to uh, put those uh, put that infrastructure together. That's a great, um, um, much appreciated. Are there any other of the CPMC members who want to who want to sort of echo that or 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 take that in a in another direction? Um, we're coming up on on several minutes remaining before the the, the close of our session. Um, and I would also throw the topic open for you know you know throw the throw the floor open, um, um, just in case anyone missed um, the, the the high points of um, of, of Sean's remarks, um, that there will be um, certificates of registration and recordation in the copyright public record system in 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 the next release. So that is a that is a thing that's that's coming up specifically for. The certificates. Not talking about any, you know, any additional, like not the, not a form that you would fill out. But, and then also, I did want to point out that um, the new copyright warehouse. Um, there was actually a modernization web webinar. Um, it's been, um, I think, eighteen months ago now, maybe in October of twenty twenty. Um, but I would encourage anyone who's following along, who's sort of specifically interested in that topic. To, to, to jump back and watch the, the, that webinar as well. Um, we're getting notes from a couple of the members that they've got a hard stop at, at 3.30. So I wanted to um, give my, my warmest thanks to the members for joining us today on what is in Washington, a hot and soon to be stormy uh, um, summer afternoon. Our next public meeting will be in January or February of 2023. It's hard to believe that it's, it's, it's that far along. And we'll be in contact with the members. And we will also be releasing a um, recording of this webinar to the public. Um, that'll go out on loc.gov, but we'll also send a note 
to all of the copyright public modernization committee members um, as as soon as that's posted for 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 wide sharing hopefully um, so without further ado i want to thank you all for joining us today we'll be following up with you via email in the next couple of days and that concludes our third public meeting of the Library of Congress's Copyright Public Modernization Committee. Thank you all for joining. <laughs>